I've worked really hard on this mail out, so I thought maybe you guys would like to hear uh, what I wrote. Like I said, first thing they'll see is that, and then it says, please read my letter. And here is my letter. Agent in charge. For most of my life, I didn't know that my father was suspected of drug trafficking. At the time that I found out that my father was connected to the only LSD manufacturers in the world, I was constantly being intimidated by NSA agents in San Antonio such as Jay. For example, the day after a girl named S from Oak Hills Church told me that she'd been interrogated by federal agents following a raid on a horse ranch, someone broke into my house and broke my upstairs door. When I alerted my parents about the broken door, they acted like they didn't hear me. Fearing for my life, I did a hunger strike in the summer of 2013, protesting federal agents giving free meth to middle schoolers at Lewis Palmer Middle School in Monument, Colorado. After 47 days, I gave up on the hunger strike, but I immediately regretted the decision. I left Colorado Springs and hitchhiked to Washington, D.C. to do another hunger strike. On my way to Washington, D.C., I was forced to return to Texas because I was robbed of everything I owned. Shortly thereafter, I met the four-star general in charge of the Allied forces in Korea. The general gave me his business card, but someone recently broke into my house and stole both the business card and evidence that I worked for the CTO of the NSA. I found out about the drug labs while attending the Rainbow Gathering in Washington State. At the time, I thought a random drug trafficking organization wanted me to drive drugs for them because no one would suspect me. After all, I graduated from Baylor University. My dad is in the drug and alcohol education business. My mom has a degree in criminology. She was a parole officer in Houston. My mom was also the coordinator for the National Day of Prayer in both Colorado and California. After the Rainbow Gathering, I followed a trail of bread comes to Northern California where I met a woman named Sherry and a man named T. Troy told me three, Troy sold me three hits of LSD that made me hallucinate for two straight weeks. At the beginning of the acid trip, Sherry drove me and her daughters to Lake Tahoe. On the way to Lake Tahoe, while I was hallucinating, Sherry started leaving random packages all over the place that looked like drugs. After Sherry started dropping off packages, I made a decision. I didn't want to go to prison. I didn't want to sell drugs. I was a happy Buddhist. I rejected materialism. There was no way I'd let my greed lead me to prison. However, because I was on a massive amount of LSD, I stole a woman's named Melanie's car without fully realizing that I stole the car. Fortunately, the car was returned without charges being filed. Melanie is from Placerville, California. Ever since my hunger strike, I've been the spokesperson for the largest illegal drug manufacturer in the world. During my hunger strike, I explained that the American dollar depends on illegal drugs. It costs a penny to manufacture a hit of LSD. Because of this, drugs can be sold in poor countries for extremely low prices, allowing Americans to access foreign currencies from third world consumers that companies like Apple and Microsoft could never access. Without illegal drugs, the US would not be able to access so many foreign currencies. Without diverse foreign currency holdings, the dollar would not be dominant. My life is terrifying. Random people intimidate me all the time. I'm followed everywhere I go. Yesterday, I drove about 10 miles down a dirt road to a dead end to sell my iPhone. After I sold my phone, someone was standing next to their car waiting for me at the end of the driveway. About a year ago, I visited one of my closest friends, Lily, from Manitou Springs, Colorado. Lily left me alone with her boyfriend, Cody, who told me that he'd been arrested for stalking someone with a bag full of guns and a 100 round magazine in Lubbock, Texas. Cody then asked me if I wanted to see his 40 caliber Glock. I said, sure. Cody then handed me the gun without telling me that the gun was loaded. After I realized that the gun was loaded, I backed away from the hallway, cleared the chamber, and unloaded the gun. As I turned around the corner to give the gun back to Cody, he shot a cap gun. Before my hunger strike, someone shot a bullet past my dad's head in my San Antonio neighborhood. At the time, I lived in the same neighborhood as Max Ucato. In other words, it's a rich neighborhood. When I was 18 years old, I traveled to Colorado from San Antonio to visit an old girlfriend. During the trip, I ran into Brad from Monument, Colorado. Brad's brother, Andrew, is who talked me into doing cocaine for the first time when I was 14 years old. After I ran into Brad, my hood flew through my windshield of my car. I'm fairly certain that the police tampered with my car to try to kill me. The last time I drove from San Antonio to Colorado, a man was waiting for me in the lobby of my hotel. He told me that I'd been poisoned and I needed to go to the hospital. The hospital flushed my system and I'm still not sure if someone actually poisoned me. That was 2018. Around the same time, a man waited for me in the elevator at my hotel and told me he knew I was going to drive north. 
Ever since I moved back to Colorado, I've been threatened by random people. One of the cops' favorite things to do is fake like they're drawing a gun on me. About a year ago, the day after I wrote online that the FBI should leave Colorado Springs because they put everyone in danger, a man sat down near me at a country club in Monument, Colorado. The man said that he was from Quantico. When he faked, then, no, then he faked like he was drawing a gun on me. At the time, I had a concealed carry permit. The man was trying to get me to draw my gun so that he could kill me. This is when the story gets confusing because I work for the CIA. I'm the spokesperson for a drug lab, but I do information, but I also do information operations for the government. I'm also very good at computer security. I have a master's degree. I'm a memory, memory forensics specialist. Years after my hunger strike, I was accepted to graduate school at the University of Texas in San Antonio. My main professor was so-so, the director of the Information Warfare Operations Center at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. So-and-so both taught me about cybersecurity and how to do information operations. I'm in, a unique position to, I'm in a unique position to do information operations because I attended college at an elite university in Cairo, Egypt. My Eric professor at Baylor was Colonel Baker, the former defense attache to Israel for the Defense Intelligence Agency. According to a DIA recruiter I spoke with, the defense attache to Israel is the head spy to Israel. For obvious reasons, a lot of people in the Middle East thought that I was a spy even though I wasn't. I garnered a lot of attention because of my relationship with both Colonel Baker and um, so-and-so's daughter, so-and-so. I also got attention because I attended college in Waco, Texas, next door to George W. Bush's ranch. I gained so much attention that someone tried to poison me in Dahab, Egypt. The person that I said so-and-so, he was the spokesperson for the CIA. Um, the attention I gained from both my relationship with Colonel Baker and the hunger strike put me in a unique position to do information operations. I tricked bankers into shorting the stock market at a terrible time to short. I also made sure everyone knew that betting against the American dollar would destroy their currency. Unfortunately, not all of the attention I gained was beneficial. People hate drugs. People want to kill me because I speak for the drug lab. Before moving back to Colorado, I got a job writing cybersecurity software for the Department of Homeland Security. While I was writing software to automate memory forensic investigations, I caught the NSA hacking me and the government freaked out. One day, my boss invited me to a meeting and five to 10 people in suits showed up. One of them said that he was the CTO of the NSA and he literally said, the president wants you to write an updated version of Santoku Linux to do, member, to do forensic investigations of cell phones. The real reason I thought the NSA showed up to my work was because I, I'd figured out how to catch NSA hackers using the beta version of a network IDS called Security Onion, and I wrote a report about the hack. The NSA does, does, in, does DNS redirection attacks. At the time, I didn't understand that the NSA was also afraid of my memory forensics program. My software catches the sunburst hack if you know how to look at the output. PowerShell will show up in the master file table, but it won't show up in the PowerShell logs, assuming PowerShell logging is enabled in the group policy. My software catches all hacks that use the same vehicle as the SolarWinds hack. Uh, and then I have, an, it says all, win all Windows Kerberos attacks that I know of use PowerShell. This letter is already too long, so I'll get to the main point about why I'm contacting you. While I was working directly for the C2 of the NSA, I realized that certain people in the intelligence community, John Kelly and Joe Biden, were blackmailing Donald Trump to control his political appointments. Right after I talked about it, I noticed someone stalking me at the Silver Fox Bar in Leon Springs, Texas. The Silver Fox is lo located next door to a CIA base called Camp Stanley. Eventually, the person I noticed following me introduced himself and told me that he was an explosives expert for an oil and gas company. The man ranted incessantly about how much he hated Austin. He said that only steers and queers come from Austin. After I talked about the president being blackmailed, the man's friend told me that they wanted to start a civil war. The bomb expert's friend also said something about how the soil of freedom needs to be fertilized with the blood of traitors and patriots alike. The day after I gave a description of the Austin bomber both online and to the FBI, a picture of the bomber was released to the media with the bomber's face hidden. The bomber's body type met my description exactly, white male, late 30s, short, beer belly, but not actually fat. After the bomber's arrest, the Huffington Post released an article claiming that someone lied to the media about Mark Anthony Condit's homeschool group. Mark Condit didn't know how to make bombs. Within 24 hours of the article being published, the article was removed from the internet. The real bomber was a Fed targeting suspected drug traffickers. In June of 2020, I started contacting people via the meet. I started contacting people from the media via Twitter claiming that Donald Trump was being blackmailed by the intelligence community and that there's no Austin bomber confession. Then in July, my neighbor Jason walked up to the edge of my yard and faked like he was drawing a gun on me. 
He then turned around and showed me that he was wearing a Magnum Shooting Center shirt. Jason's message was clear. I'll kill you if you don't stop contacting the media about the Austin bomber. Jason is the director of sales for Oracle. I don't know if Jason is CIA, undercover DEA, FBI, or if he's a foreign intelligence person, but what I know is that he threatened me with a gun to provoke a response. In response to the threat, I wrote a note to Jason telling him that I had a concealed carry permit and that if he fakes like he's drawing a gun on me again, I might accidentally kill him. I was then arrested for felony menacing. Colorado Springs was the cornerstone of illegal drug distribution for our drug trafficking organization for decades. The government, government here is saturated with anti-drug undercover agents. M my greatest nightmare is that I can't leave this city because I'm facing felony menacing charges for writing Jason a note that said, please don't fake, fake like you're drawing a gun on me. I'm concerned I'll kill you. I haven't been convicted, but Judge S put me in jail for 15 days for contempt of court because I said, he's not a victim. Then the judge told me that if I talk again, he'd put me in jail. I stayed silent for two plus minutes, but I was my own lawyer. So after two plus minutes, I said, can I say something now? The judge immediately put me in jail where the sheriff's department tried to get me beat up. A huge black inmate took a swing at me directly in front of a guard, but stopped right before hitting me. The guards ignored it and refused to move me to a safer locations, location despite four requests. When the sheriffs finally moved me following an altercation, almost fight, with a different inmate, they put me in a cell with someone who passionately hated both Jewish and gay people. At the time, I identified as a bisexual Jew. Now I don't think I'm Jewish because I don't think my mother is my genetic mother. My final cellmate spent four days ranting about how all Jews should die, Moses was a duty, dirty Jew, and talking about how much he hates fags. My final cellmate also told me that he'd spent two years in ASEG, kept in a cell alone, because he has a personality problem. My cellmate told me that he talked his last cellmate into faking like he was suicidal by threatening to strangle him in his sleep and making it look like he hung himself. My theory is that the sheriff's department didn't care if I got beat, beat up, but they wanted to get me in a fight so that they could keep me in jail. In Colorado Springs, there's nothing more dangerous than speaking out against the police. Undercover cops control this town. The interrogation an FBI agent did of me while I was in jail and half the body cam footage of my arrest went missing following my arrest, but no one cares because dirty cops control this town. James Lamberth, a retired DEA agent, is who destroyed the evidence. I wrote Jason the note because I don't want to kill anyone. I want to be left alone. I'm sick of people intimidating me. I'm sick of cops trying to murder me. I have a master's degree in computers. I'm a talented graphic designer and an incredible musician. The only reason I live in Colorado Springs is because the government is forcing YouTube to censor my views to prevent me from having money. If I had money, I'd hire a lawyer. If I had money, I'd never live in Colorado Springs. The police here are more vicious than anywhere in the world. Like I said before, Colorado Springs used to be the cornerstone of drug trafficking in the United States and the entire world. I don't know what to do now. The cops want me dead and I don't know how to survive without your help. This morning, a flat panel van stopped in the middle of the road and blocked my car from moving. Then someone got out of the side of the van and nothing happened. All I was doing was waiting to get an oil change and someone thought it was fun to scare me or a random person stopped in the middle of the street and scared me by accident. I don't want to be afraid anymore. I just want to be left alone. Please help me. And then I signed it. And then I said, I had a PS here. It says, PS, I was a legally registered presidential candidate during the 2020 election. One of the main reasons I ran for president was because I knew I was being censored and I wanted federal law enforcement to commit election fraud by censoring me. If the FBI is allowed to commit election fraud by censoring a third party candidate, I fear for our democracy. We don't live in a two party country. We live in a democracy. In a democracy, the people decide what the laws are, not the cops. If the FBI censors someone to prevent them from trying to change the law, we don't live in a democracy. Then I say both the CEOs of YouTube and Twitter should be arrested for tampering with the federal election. And then on, on the back, I have a list of people to contact. Um, and I, like the person who walked up to me and uh, so and so, uh, I, like I traveled to West Texas to help clean up after the the fertilizer plant blew up. During my trip, I ran into Dave. Dave told me that the building that exploded was not a fertilizer plant. He told me that the explosion was not an accident over a year before the information was released to the public. Um, then this other guy told me that my people had set me up to look guilty. That's why the feds were so vicious to me. Um, then I have a lot of people on this list. Um, So-and-so told me that um, their son 
uh, vandalized a golf course because according to the person, they were selling drugs there. Um, then there's this guy that tried to get me addicted to oxycodone. Like he was like, really like, like, come on, drink, 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 drink. And I was like, I'm not, I'm at work. I'm not going to drink alcohol while I'm at work. And he looked really disappointed. Um, but he was also the first person that ever, I ever smoked pot with in seventh grade. And I don't know how he got pot in seventh grade. And then there's my mom's business partner on here. My uncle who might know something. The guy who shot a cap gun is on there. My aunt, my professor who was always mean to me. Like he was like the constantly mean to me while I was in grad school. Um, I put him on there because uh, after I wrote on Facebook that all of my 60 followers should call their congressperson every day, my professor mentioned it in class. Um, then there's my aunt. It's a, a lot of family members on there. Uh, my friend Josh from Manitou and his sister. Um, my friend whose um, grandfather talked to me and told me he was arrested in, in Santa Barbara, California for drugs, but he pled insanity. He's on my list. So um, the reality is I, I, I know that a lot of people think that the FBI isn't going to care, but um, that's why I'm sending it to like over a hundred different FBI offices. And um, I, I, I think the Secret Service will care and I'm sending it to over a hundred people that are Secret Service agents. Um, the DEA, I feel like they're worried that they won't have an organization if this comes out. Um, but yeah, that's my letter. Um, hope it didn't bore you too much.